What is HelloFresh? With HelloFresh, you get farm fresh, pre-portioned ingredients, and seasonal recipes delivered right to your doorstep. Skip the trips to the grocery store and count on HelloFresh to make home cooking easy, fun, and affordable. That's why it's America's number one meal kit. Fall is right around the corner, and HelloFresh is there to help you plan for the busy season ahead with tasty dishes delivered right to your door. You just simply choose recipes and pick your delivery date, then lay back and enjoy the last days of summer, knowing that dinner is covered. Parents have enough back-to-school shopping and planning to do. Let HelloFresh get the groceries and save you some cash with pre-portioned meals, again, delivered right to your door. So when life gets busy, don't call for delivery. Go with HelloFresh. I've been using HelloFresh for a while now, and I cannot tell you how much simpler making dinner has become. It really does give me one less thing to worry about. So go to HelloFresh.com slash 50 who killed and use code 50 who killed for 50% off plus free shipping. Again, go to HelloFresh.com slash 50 who killed and use code 50 who killed for 50% off plus free shipping. What's up? It's Kaylee Cuoco. When it comes to travel, we all have a happy place. I just went to my happy place. I just went to Maui and it was truly amazing. Priceline has always been about getting you to your happy place for a happy price with deals you really can't find anywhere else. Like up to 60% off select hotels in Costa Rica or five-star hotels for two-star prices in Cabo. Go to your happy place for a happy price. Go to your happy price, Priceline. Slow Burn Media, an evergreen podcast, presents Who Killed, a podcast that provides a voice for the voiceless. Denver police have identified a serial killer who murdered five women more than 40 years ago. Four murders were unsolved. Dolores Bajalas, Gwendolyn Harris, Madeline Levatis, and Antoinette Parks, families who have lived with uncertainty for decades. But his killing stopped when Aurora police officer Deborah Sukor pulled him over in June of 1981. He got a hold of her gun and used it to kill her when he got out of handcuffs. So CBS4's Michael Abeda joins us now. And Michael, even 40 years later, these families were still waiting for closure. Yeah, Mackenzie, I spoke to the two remaining brothers of one of the women that was killed, and they say it is a relief to know this many years later what happened to their sister. Now, Denver police say Joe Michael Irvin killed the four women between 1978 and 1981. Those women are Madeline Lividay, Dolores Barajas, Gwendolyn Harris, and Antoinette Parks. Those killings stopped when he took his own life while in custody for the murder of Aurora police officer Deborah Corr. Denver police say the DNA science helped them solve this case, first by linking the four victims to the same killer. Next, they used that DNA to find a living family member of the suspect. Next, they exhumed, body of the suspect and used, they exhumed the body of the suspect and used his DNA to confirm he had killed the four women. The daughters of Madeline Lividay and the brothers of Antoinette Parks were present at the announcement and spoke to the media. They say this has been a long time coming and a roller coaster of emotions. Hello and welcome to this week's episode of Who Killed? I'm your host, Bill Huffman, and this is a Slow Burn Media, Evergreen Podcasts, and Killer Podcasts production. I hope you guys have been well. As you know, there's always something new in true crime as cases are solved every day. And cases occur every day. So since the last episode aired, I actually had a case in my neighborhood, or somewhat in my neighborhood, actually occurred a few miles away where a 20-year-old woman, Alexa Bartel, was driving in her car and she was struck by a rock and killed. Now, the rock had come through her windshield while she was driving down Indiana Street and This struck her in the head and caused her vehicle to drive off the road. Now, she had been speaking with a friend on her cell phone, and this was around 1045, and she just suddenly stopped talking. So once her friend wasn't able to get her back on the phone, she used a phone tracking app and was able to locate her vehicle. And this is the sad and tragic part, is that she actually found Alexa and that she had been killed. And this was clearly a purposeful act as the police found the rock within the vehicle. 
And they had also received reports of other incidents the night of April 19th and 20th. But after a five-day manhunt, I'm happy to say that multiple police departments and the Jefferson County Sheriff were able to announce that they had arrested three 18-year-olds for the crime and charged them with first-degree murder. So you might think that's a pretty hefty charge, but there are probably going to be more charges that are coming. So since then, the investigators worked around the clock to identify and arrest these suspects, and this is according to a press release. And it's not clear which suspect was driving or who threw the rock, but apparently they all did. And according to the press release, quote, ultimately mobile device forensics and supporting information from the public helped lead to the identification and arrest of the suspects. In the hour before Bartel's death, six other cars had rocks, a type commonly used in landscaping, thrown at them. According to authorities, two of the drivers suffered minor injuries. Lyft and Uber driver Nathan Tipton was uninjured after being targeted. Now, he did speak to reporters at a news conference this past Tuesday, and he said he was headed southbound on Highway 93, close to the Jefferson County and Boulder County lines, around 1015. He said, quote, I saw two vehicles going northbound, but all I could see was the headlights. It was a dark road, he said. Quote, and then a large shatter. It sounded like a shotgun blast. It scared the heck out of me. He said he pulled over right away and saw that both driver's side windows of his minivan had been shattered. It's horrible. Somebody should not lose their child for a random act of whatever this is, he said. Quote, investigators were glad to be able to notify Alexa's family and other victims of these arrests. This week's recognition of crimes victims' rights reminds us of the courage and resilience of crime victims, including the Bartell family. They are our motivation, the statement read. So the Jefferson County Sheriff's Office said they arrested Joseph Koenig, Nicholas Mitch Carol Chick, and Zachary Quack. The three men, all 18-year-olds, were taken into custody at their homes in Arvada. Could you imagine being the parent of one of these children and knowing that they just ruined the lives of a fa- another family and then, well, their arrests ruin your family as well. So this is one of those things where uh, you really do not want to have some sociopathic child running around throwing rocks at cars. So as the one victim stated, no one should lose a child in the way that Alexa was taken. And again, this has created the domino effect, as I had mentioned before. And again, this will play a role in all of these families' lives from here on out. So it's very unfortunate, but it's a very nice thing to see police departments working together to come together and solve a crime such as this, because it was like pretty nerve wracking and it did cause concern because there's nothing more vulnerable than being on the road at night and you have no control. You can't see what other people are doing. So this is a good opportunity for the police to take care of what they, uh, what, what anybody would fear is just being vulnerable. So let's just uh, say kudos to the cops and uh, let's move on to uh, this week's episode. And this one's kind of an interesting one because it does involve the Denver police again, but this is a case that is 40 years, eh, 40 plus years old. And it was in June of 1981 when one Joe Irvin was pulled over for a traffic violation. The police officer making the stop was unaware this would be her last. Aurora police officer Deborah Sukor pulled Irvin over for a traffic violation while on patrol and attempted to handcuff him. But unfortunately, Irvin was able to get Cora's weapon and actually fatally shot her. According to the incident report, a 26-year-old Aurora policewoman was shot and killed after she stopped a car on the suspicion that its driver was intoxicated. A 19-year-old explorer scout who attempted to assist the policewoman during the incident was injured seriously after he was shot and wounded during the altercation. 
Deborah Sue Kaur had just finished her first year on the Aurora Police Force before she lost her life in the line of duty. Well, again, she was apparently trying to arrest the driver. She was overpowered and then was shot in the head and shoulder. Now, this is what kind of led police to one Joe Michael Irvin. And he was 30 years old at the time, and he was located at his Aurora apartment, and he was taken into custody for the slaying of this police officer. Now, it was later learned that Irvin was wanted on murder charges out of Fort, Fort Worth, Texas, and when the shooting occurred, he was actually out on bond awaiting trial in Denver for sexual assault, kidnapping, and burglary. So this guy was uh, not a winner. And the thing is, police had no idea that they had a serial killer in custody. And this would be a mystery that they wouldn't find out for another 40 years. According to the Bureau of Justice Assistance, last winter police in Denver announced that they had solved the case, cold case murders of four women who had died about 40 years ago, all of whom had been the victims of one man, a previously unknown serial killer named Joe Michael Irvin. From allthatsinteresting.com, Irvin was born on June 25th, 1951 in Fort Worth, Texas. He apparently killed his first victim before he was even 18. He apparently was uh, at a bowling alley on August 8th, 1969, when he walked up to the driver's side of a parked car and shot a 21-year-old in the neck before fleeing. The Tarrant County Junior College student died four days later when Fort Worth police issued a statewide warrant for Irvin. Now, the killer had phoned Bonham's father upon hearing the news of his son's death and said he felt remorse. He said, I'm sorry he's dead, but we all have to go sometime. I'm sorry I shot him. Kind of an interesting character. So, in this Bureau of Justice report, Justice Assistance Report. They say that the uh, Fury Levidius, a mother of two, was killed at her Denver home in December of 1978. Barajas was killed while walking to work in August of 1980. In December of 1980, Harris was found stabbed to death on a street corner about one block from Irvin's residence at the time. In January 1981, Parks was found stabbed to death several miles north of downtown Denver. Disgustingly enough, she was six to seven months pregnant at the time. So the report kind of goes on to state that, you know, during the 70s, 80s, there was somebody stabbing women, and it was not clear if there was any connections to these crimes. Maybe they were just random And again, they were stabbings, but there really wasn't any evidence. This was pre-DNA time. Uh, Not that they didn't take evidence and retrieve evidence from the scene. It just wasn't something that was used scientifically. It wasn't even on the horizon, at least in police forces across the U.S. So at the time, the cases did not appear to be related, and Irvin was never a suspect in any of them. Shortly after the fourth murder, Irvin shot and killed the police officer that we mentioned earlier. He then took his life in jail. So when he killed himself more than 40 years ago, he was actually in jail for that shooting of the police officer. And he was indicted on first-degree murder and attempted murder. He was found dead while in solitary confinement at the Adams County Jail during a routine check that evening. He did write a note confessing to Cora's murder before hanging himself. Now, Denver police did say that Irvin was a serial killer who also stabbed three women and a teenage girl to death. And those are the three women that we were just discussing. And these occurred from 1978 to 1981. Someone had stabbed Dolores Barajas, Gwendolyn Harris, Madeline Levedis, as well as Antoinette Parks. And... This, again, is one of those cases where you really don't know how big of a monster you really have in front of you, but with what you do have is a serial killer. And when he killed Deborah Sue Cord, that was actually the first police officer to die in the line of duty. And 
it is something that you really look at because she'd only been on the police force for a year. So what cops were able to do within that 40 years is that they were able to link the four stabbing deaths by re-examining DNA evidence between 2013 to 2018. The evidence began to point to a suspect when authorities located a relative in Texas. From there, authorities were able to exhume Irvin's body and they were able to find a match. Two brothers of Antoinette Parks said they believe the teen would have one day opened a daycare. Quote, she was young, vivacious, George Journey said, joined by brother Carl. Quote, she loved children. She was a good student. She was also pregnant and about to become a mother herself, according to Denver's television station KCNC. Parks was the youngest of six and a high school student in Aurora. She loved music. Her family described her as caring, determined, and loved children. Now her family also would go on to say that she would have probably worked in childcare. And again, another life too young taken. And then you have uh, Madeline, who is a mother of two, and Irvin knocked on her door just randomly on December 7th, 1978, and just stabbed her to death. She was found in her bedroom. Now, she was a writer and an editor for the Ranger Rick magazine. Anybody who is a child from that, uh, heck, in the 80s, 90s, you know what Ranger Rick is. And you saw it at every dentist office and doctor's office across this country. So, interesting there, but it's another tragedy because... The daughters, Molly and Ariel, said that Irving stole the life that they could have had with their mother. Quote, we didn't grow up with her and hear her stories and witness the contribution she would have made to the world. Now, she told this to CBS. Quote, Madeline grew up in Central Florida, one of five sisters, and was an avid swimmer, continued to swim throughout her life. She attended high school in Florida and graduated from Tulane University. Prior to getting married, she had led an adventurous life, traveling to Africa and Europe as part of her work as an editor on the beloved children's magazine, Ranger Rick. Now, this is from a statement from her family. The statement continued, quote, Her greatest joys in life came after the birth of her two daughters, whom she cherished beyond anything. She was a loving wife and a mother of two at the time of her death. Now, the Lovatis family's and the Fury families are grateful for receiving answers after all these years, and they express their gratitude as they continue to put you know, work in by all the individuals in this case. And so Denver Police spokesman Doug Shepman said Barajas and Harris's families live outside Colorado, but did have statements to share. Quote, Dolores Barajas was a wife, mother, grandmother, and a beloved part of a loving family according to the family statement. And this was according to the ABC affiliate KMGH. And Barajas was actually visiting her family in Denver this summer that she was killed. And she was working at a hotel downtown. The Sunday she was killed was actually supposed to be her last day before she had returned home, according to her family. And they also expressed appreciation for all those who helped solve the case. And this is according to the press release. Harris was a mother, a sister, daughter, aunt, granddaughter, and niece, according to the police department. Harris was found stabbed to death in December 1980 when she was 27 years old. Harris was last seen at a lounge in downtown Denver, just a block away from where Irving lived. Now, Gwen was a bright, soft-spoken, athletic young woman who enjoyed life, always had a smile on her face. And cops said that while relating the thoughts of her relatives that her family also shared that because of the decision of another to take life with no regard, the 1980 murder of Gwendolyn Harris was devastating and unimaginable to the family. Gwen will forever be in our hearts and always our joy. Glenn Spies, 19, he was the one who actually came across the fatal encounter between Officer Corr and Irvin. And he was actually in the Aurora's Police Explorer program and was driving home after his shift. So it's kind of interesting. And, uh, you know, he goes on to say that I pulled behind her car. I got out and I tried to assist 
the officer, at which time I heard her scream for help. And this is according to K KCNC. I heard gunfire and tried to duck behind the patrol unit. He shot me and I fell to the ground. The bullet shattered near his spine. Spies still struggles to walk today, and the television station reported that he does not regret making the fateful decision to intervene all those years ago. Quote, that's part of me, he said. Quote, I love to help people out, and I would do it again. So I want to read to you a BJA report. And again, this is the Bureau of Justice Assistance. Now they asked the question, quote, how, after so many years, was the truth uncovered? According to the report, it took years of old-school police work and a cutting-edge investigative technique called forensic gene genetic genealogy. We've discussed this many times. It took the combined efforts of law enforcement in Colorado and Texas, along with the support of the Bureau of Justice Assistance, which used two different grants to help crack the case. The Denver Police Crime Laboratory linked the four cold cases using DNA evidence between 2013 and 2018. After conducting a familial search, the crime laboratory identified Irving and exhumed his remains in Texas for a direct DNA comparison to the crime scene evidence. And it took the efforts of two determined investigators, Detective Kerry Johnson of the Denver, Colorado, Police Department and Dr. Angela Williamson, the forensics unit supervisor at BJA, who recently shared this story on this Justice Today podcast. So if you guys want to learn more, check out Justice Today and look up the case that we are discussing of Joe Irvin. And Dr. Williamson and Detective Johnson became involved in the J Joe Michael Irvin case about four years prior to this press conference. Now, Detective Johnson inherited an open investigation when she joined Denver's cold case squad in 2018. DNA evidence had linked the four murders to a single perpetrator, but years of police work had eliminated all known suspects. That was when Detective Johnson's team began to use the familial genealogy, and that is when they were able to um, get a, start narrowing things down. So, quote, for so, quite some time now, genealogists have been using publicly available ancestry databases. Dr. Williamson had told Justice Today, quote, you can submit your own DNA sample, which is usually just saliva from your mouth on a swab. And based on the DNA, then you can trace your ancestry. Quote, using that same methodology, you can upload a DNA profile from an unknown person, in this case, an unknown murderer, Dr. Williamson said. Then you can mine these databases to see if you can find any relatives. Typically, it's not the person who's responsible for the crime. It's usually not even a close relative like a sibling. It's often a very distant relative like a third cousin, twice removed. And that's where the hard work comes in. Detective Johnson's team in the Denver Cold Case Unit spent months using this technology to construct family lines that trace the perpetrator's family to Texas. She requested assistance from the Texas Rangers, and in June 2021, several Rangers asked her to join them on a conference call. Quote, through all of this, there are so many emotional highs and lows because you think you're on the right track, and then you get big goose eggs, Detective Johnson said. But there were 11 participants on that call, so we figured it was good news. The Rangers had found a potential familial DNA match to a Texas offender named Paul Irvin. Detective Johnson already knew that Paul Irvin was not their killer because his DNA was not an exact match to the samples from the Denver area crime scene. Quote, but his jail intake paperwork listed a brother and that we had not heard of, Detective Johnson said. And that brother was... Joe Michael Irvin. Quote, we are still on that call when my phone starts dinging, she said. Quote, and it's Tracy Carlson from the lab. And she's like, quote, I just found a marriage certificate in Colorado for Joe Irvin. I just found a residential address for Joe Irvin in the Denver area around the time of our murders. So through all this, we're like, this has to be our guy, unquote. Investigators discovered that Joe Michael Irvin had been buried in a family plot in Texas. They did exhume his body, 
And that was due to a BJ grant. And that was when they were able to find a match. Now, again, this is one of those examples of just staying on the case. And what we have here is a lot of people coming together to find an answer. So let's look at what we've got. And that is long it wasn't long after his body was exhumed that the dna evidence definitively proved that he had killed all four of the denver area victims detective johnson was able to contact the victims families to tell them the cases had been solved quote a lot of people have asked what does this feel like detective johnson said and there's such a variety of responses i could give and emotions that come attached to them the biggest one is telling these families who have waited 40 years who had given up hope and who thought they would never find answers about what happened to their loved ones. Having those personal conversations with them, it's life-changing in so many ways. But there's so many important cases, Detective Johnson said. Utilizing these grants that Angela and the BGA awarded us, my partner in the cold case unit, just made an arrest on a kidnapping sexual assault. So I'm excited about being a part of this generation of investigator where these things are available to us. And that is according to the Bureau of Justice Assistance. So, again, let's give a round of applause to everybody in this episode who did their job to a very high degree. And they were able to connect a lot of different murders and solve a lot of different uh, issues with these families. I mean, you just think for 40 years... you. You, you don't think you're going to get an answer. And then all of a sudden, you know, you have a press conference that announces, yeah, we got a guy and unfortunately he has passed away, but we can finally say who did this crime. And that is something that isn't always done. So Joe Michael Irvin, you did the right thing by killing yourself and saving the justice department and hell the public for paying for your jailing because you'd probably still be in jail so anyway that pretty much wraps up this week's episode i'm gonna play you guys the press conference from the uh announcement when they did make the determination that this was a joe michael irvin case serial killer uh all that great stuff and it's pretty interesting you know i just like to play these because they are informative and you do get to hear it from the horse's mouth so might as well uh stay tuned and again thank you guys so much for listening i wouldn't be here without you if you guys want to donate to the show you can do so via venmo with my username at who killed otherwise i drop new shows every friday and you know as always stay healthy and be safe But stay tuned and I will play you the news conference announcing the serial killer, Joe Michael Irvin. Uh, First, welcome. Uh, My name is Doug Shepman. I'm with the Denver Police Public Affairs Office. And I want to thank you all for being here for this announcement regarding the identification of a suspect in four cold case homicides, uh, three of which occurred in Denver one of which occurred in Adams County between the years of 1978 and 1981. Uh, Before introducing our speakers, um, we want to extend our condolences to the families of the victims who were able to be here with us today. Um, Also want to acknowledge the partner agencies that contributed to the successful closure of these cases. Uh, It's a long list. Uh, We have a number of agencies represented here today. I'll just go in alphabetical order. Uh, We have the Adams County Sheriff's Office, the Aurora Police Department, Colorado Bureau of Investigations, Denver Department of Public Safety, Denver District Attorney's Office, Denver Police Cold Case Unit, Denver Police Crime Laboratory, Forensic Biology and DNA Unit, Metro Denver Crime Stoppers, and the U.S. Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms, and Explosives, Denver Field Division. 
Other partners who assisted, but who are not represented here, are the Federal Bureau of Investigation, Denver Division, Texas Department of Public Safety, Texas Rangers, Tarrant County, Texas Sheriff's Office, and the University of North Texas Forensic Center for Human Identification. It's a long list of partners, which I think speaks to the expansiveness of the investigations that helped us to come to the closure of these cases. With that, I'll introduce Commander Matt Clark from the Denver Police Major Crimes Division section, uh, who will share information about the cases as well as the investigations. Thank you, Deb. Good morning. Thank you for being here and allowing us to highlight the stories of four members of our community who were tragically killed over 40 years ago. Throughout this portion of the briefing, I want to make certain I honor the victims and respect the wishes of their families. I'll provide an overview of each incident uh, without offering detailed descriptions of the circumstances surrounding each death. While explaining a chronology of the events, I will also attempt to illustrate the incredible investigative efforts and collaboration of various detectives, scientists, and law enforcement agencies that led to the identification of the offender responsible for the deaths of these women. I'll begin pro by providing a timeline and a brief description of events as we now know them. On Thursday, December 7th, 1978, at 6.15 p.m., 33-year-old Madeline Lividay was found deceased in her residence in the 1600 block of Poplar Street in Denver. Investigators determined the offender entered the victim's residence and stabbed her multiple times, causing her death. On Sunday, August 10, 1980, at 7.10 in the morning, Denver police officers were called to the 500 block of East 17th Avenue on a report of a woman lying in the roadway. Arriving officers discovered 53-year-old Dolores Barajas suffering from multiple stab wounds. Ms. Barajas died at the scene. On Sunday, December 21st, 1980, at 10.45 in the morning, a 911 call was made regarding an unconscious woman lying in the street near East 47th Avenue and Andrews Drive in the Montbello neighborhood. The responding officers located 27-year-old Gwendolyn Harris deceased at the location. Ms. Harris had been stabbed multiple times. On Saturday, January 24, 1981, members of the Adams County Sheriff's Office were called to the area of 64th Avenue and Broadway on a report of a female lying in a field. When deputies arrived, they located 17-year-old Antoinette Parks, who had been stabbed multiple times. Ms. Parks was deceased. The investigators and forensic scientists who conducted the initial investigation of these deaths 40 years ago used all available resources and investigative methods that were available to them as they attempted to identify the offender responsible in each case. They spent a tremendous amount of time on these investigations, following leads and questioning potential suspects. Despite these efforts, the investigators were not able to determine the identity of the offender in these cases. The investigative leads were exhausted and the investigation of each of these four homicides turned cold. That potentially could have been the end of this story had it not been for the diligence and tenacity of the investigative team of detectives and forensic scientists who re-examined each case over the past two decades. This team was relentless in their pursuit of the offender in this case. <clears throat> Through funding provided by Denver Metro Crime Stoppers, as well as grant awards by the National Institute of Justice and the Bureau of Justice Administration, financial resources were made available to allow the Denver Police Department to catalog and investigate cold case homicides. Since 2004, the cases involving Ms. Lividay, Ms. Barajas, and Ms. Harris have been reviewed multiple times by several Denver detectives and forensic scientists. Initially, these cases were investigated as separate incidents. But through the work of investigators and scientists, DNA evidence was discovered that began linking these cases together. This new evidence created significant momentum for the investigative team that soon snowballed. In June of 2013, the investigative team learned that DNA evidence linked the cases of Ms. Barajas and Ms. Lividay. In December of 2015, investigators and scientists reviewing evidence in Ms. Harris's case determined DNA evidence linked, uh, excuse me, DNA evidence existed that linked her to the two prior cases. This became the third case involving the same then unidentified offender. In October of 2018, it was discovered that DNA evidence in the Adams County case linked Ms. Parks to this offender as well. With this new evidence, the investigative team had renewed hope that the individual responsible for these deaths could be identified. 
In 2019, using in-house investigative genetic genealogy, the investigative team was able to narrow their focus to ancestry of the offender in Texas. In 2021, the Denver Crime Lab personnel, along with cold case investigators, work with their counterparts in Texas to conduct familial DNA searches of the Texas CODIS database. Through this work, investigators identified a relative of the offender and quickly focused their efforts on one particular individual, Joe Michael Irvin, born June 25, 1951. Detectives learned Mr. Irvin died in 1981 and was buried in Arlington, Texas. Countless efforts were made to obtain archived DNA samples to compare Mr. Irvin's DNA to the unidentified offender in the homicides. When all efforts proved unsuccessful, investigators traveled to Texas. With the assistance of state and local law enforcement officers in Texas, a search warrant was authorized to exhume Mr. Irvin's body for the purpose of obtaining a DNA sample for comparison. In January of 2022, the investigative team realized the fruits of their work over the years. The DNA sample obtained from Mr. Irvin matched the previously unidentified DNA profile of the offender believed to be responsible for the deaths of the four victims. No other victims are believed to be involved, uh, excuse me, no other suspects or offenders are believed to be involved in the deaths of these individuals. The new investigative approaches coupled with advances in technology made it possible to ultimately identify the offender in these cases. I appreciate the patience and resilience of the families and the community over the past 40 years as these cases remain unsolved. These women were not forgotten. I'll conclude uh, by expressing my sincere appreciation and uh, pride in the investigators and scientists that worked on these cases over the years. They invested a tremendous amount of time, emotion, and energy to bring closure to these cases. And each member of the investigative team made a meaningful contribution to each of these cases that ultimately resulted in the resolution of them. Thank you. Thank you, Commander Clark. At this time, I'd like to introduce George and Carl Journey, Journey who are the brothers of Antoinette Parks. Well, first of all, I'd like to say this has taken a long time. We can finally have peace knowing who did this to my little sister. Uh, me and my brother are the only re remaining siblings of six children. I wore a shirt today in memory of all my siblings. And I lost these two sisters. They were the oldest. One in 2018 to a car wreck. Um, first in Knox here in Denver. The second one died from heartbreak from the car wreck. Um, my, of course, you guys know my little sister Antoinette died in 81. And my little sister Rhonda, who was her, she passed last year, September 9th, to cancer. So with that being said, I'd like you guys to know we have closure. We're thankful for the hard work, determination, of everybody involved here. I wish my sisters and my mom could all be here to see this. Fortunately, they didn't live long enough to see this, but I know they're here with us in spirit, and I want to say thank you guys for all coming to take the time to listen to us. <clears throat> Hello, my name is Carl, and uh, you know, like my brother said, you know, it's been a long time coming, and now we can actually you know, really rest better at night. Like I said, the rest of them, they're not here. But like I said, if my mom or my sister were here, but I know they are, because they're sitting high and looking low. And they're saying right now, hey, thank you guys, every last one of you, for everything. Anybody had anything to do with this? Believe me, they're saying thank you, and God bless you all. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen, for sharing those words with us. At this time, I'll introduce Molly and Ariel Lividay. Uh, they're the daughters of Madeline Lividay, as well as cold case unit detective Carrie Johnson, who will read a statement provided by Madeline's sisters.
Good morning. My sister Ariel and I wanted to take time today to express our gratitude to the Denver Police Department and all agencies and individuals involved over the years for all of the hard work and the sacrifice in solving this series of horrific crimes. We are here to talk about our mother, Madeline Fury Liveday. She was a young woman with a very bright future. She was a writer. She had written for Nature magazines for years and had written and published a book. She was an ecologist with a passion for the natural world and the environment. She was a loving wife, sister, daughter, and mother to two very young girls. But in 1978, she had that bright future ripped away from her. Tragically, we didn't get to grow up with her and to hear her stories and to witness the contributions that she could have made to the world. It's been a lot of information to absorb so suddenly after all this time. We found out that this man murdered four more women and he assaulted an uncounted number of others. In addition, to learn about the line of duty death of Officer Deborah Sue Kaur has been personally very impactful. She was out doing her job when she attempted to arrest this serial killer for an unrelated crime. And in the course of his arrest, she was murdered herself. But with her sacrifice, she prevented him from killing anyone else. And it's clear that he wasn't gonna stop on his own. She stopped him, the police stopped him, back in 1981. And for that, for Officer Corps' sacrifice of her life, we are thankful. Finally, I would like to reflect on how the Denver Police Department has proven today that it won't stop hunting for the predators among us. For us citizens who are, like my mother was, just home feeding our children breakfast, or walking to the bus stop, or home from school. For us, the DPD cold case unit and the Denver Crime Lab and the Denver DA's office had said, have said, you're not gonna get away with it. We're gonna find you. And for that, we are here today to say thank you. It is a great relief to our family to finally have this resolution and to know that they never stopped working towards that goal for us. Thank you. Thank you. Madeline's um, sisters are all out of town and asked me to extend this statement on their behalf. So on behalf of Eileen Fury Roy, Tess Fury, and Megan Fury Kinney, Madeline had a vibrant and curious spirit. She was fearlessly adventurous and loved traveling as part of her job as an editor of the children's magazine, Ranger Rick. She loved learning. Every elementary school report card had a notation saying something like, excellent student, but talks too much. Madeline was fun and she delighted in her daughters, Molly and baby Ariel. She was a romantic who loved her life, but when her daughters were born, she was over the moon. One sweet memory we have is that she used to sing to her girls the song Stevie Wonder wrote when his daughter was born, Isn't She Lovely? She could never have imagined leaving them. It is an unmitigated tragedy that they never got to know their creative and talented mother. Madeline was loved and admired by her family and all who knew her. We will never stop missing her. Again, thank you for sharing with us here today who your mom was and why she was so loved by your family and others, especially under these difficult circumstances. Again, we appreciate that. The families of Dolores Barajas and Gwendolyn Harris live out of state. They requested privacy as they processed the developments in, this, in the case, but shared with us these messages that I'll read. 
Dolores Barajas was a wife, mother, grandmother, and a beloved part of a loving family. She had spent the summer of 1980 visiting family in Denver and working at a hotel downtown. That Sunday was to be her last day of work before returning to her home out of state. Her family still missed her very much and expressed great appreciation for everyone's efforts and determination in solving this case. Gwendolyn Denise Harris was a mother, sister, daughter, aunt, granddaughter, and niece. Gwen was a bright, soft-spoken, athletic young woman who enjoyed life and always had a smile on her face. Her family also shared that because of the decision of another to take life with no regard, the 1980 murder of Gwendolyn Harris was devastating and unimaginable to the family. Gwen will forever be in our hearts and always our joy. So as we've previously mentioned, these murders directly impacted both the Denver and the Adams County communities. So at this time, I'll invite Division Chief Dirk Budd of the Adams County Sheriff's Office to the podium. Good morning. Uh, Sheriff Ragenborn couldn't be here today. He had to attend a, a family funeral. But uh, I'm the Chief of Detectives for Adams County. Um, obviously, I'm very proud of my people. But that is not what this is about. It's about the victims and their families. Um, and I just want them to, to understand and to know that these cases, these cold cases, and I hate to use that term, but these cold cases, as they get cold and detectives retire and they, pa and they get passed on to the next detective and the next detective, and we never stop working on, the, on these cases. New technology comes around every few years, or we're, we're able to apply that to each of these cases and we revisit them to see if there's anything that we could do because we know how frustrating it is for families not to have closure. So again, this is not for us to be patted on the back. This is for the, family, the families and the victims. And uh, Mike Mills from uh, Metro Denver Crime Stoppers, we talk about this all the time. It's not for us, it's for the victims. And uh, thank you. Thank you, Division Chief Bud. Our final speaker uh, this morning is Denver Chief of Police, Paul Pazin. Good morning. Well, the closure of these four cases is a success for our department and our community. We must never forget how this is tragically impacted families and our victims and as been stated before we can never lose sight of that that is why we have a dedicated cold case unit their motto is we will never forget that is why we have a world-class crime lab with forensic scientists professional staff, dedicated individuals to bring closure to families, to help families in cases like this. As you heard today, our team did not forget Dolores, Gwendolyn, Antoinette, or Madeline. We thank each of the agencies that have been involved and all of their hard work the investigators, the forensic scientists, and everybody who contributed on this case for the past four decades. And while the perpetrator cannot fully be held accountable for his despicable actions, we hope that knowing who is responsible can bring some peace to the families. We are committed to using technology to solve more cases. But often, there is witness information out there that can help, that can help other families. So today, not only do we remember 
the victims and their families, but we also have a call to action. A call to action, there are witnesses out there that can help us solve additional murders, that can help families uh, from the great harm that has been committed to our community. Therefore, my plea, my ask, is that if you have any information on any homicide or crime, please come forward. You can do so anonymously utilizing Metro Denver Crime Stoppers. We need to help more families in our community. I do want to thank Metro Denver Crime Stoppers, which generally which generously contributed $5,000 in grants to the DPD for testing and research. Uh, their work has really helped us not only solve uh, this particular case, but several uh, cases. They've donated $41,000 over the years, and uh, it has been very helpful in 16 uh, cases. So uh, Mike Mills, president of Metro Denver Crime Stoppers, thank you. We appreciate it. Um, now I'd like to close just by saying, let us never forget these victims. And with that, we'll open it up for questions. I'm going to bring up Major Crimes Commander Clark up to talk about that. Um, without getting into the details of this, uh, there is an underlying sexual component to these uh, incidents. Uh, out of respect for the families, not at this point. Sir, would we fair to call this person a serial killer? Yes, we would classify him as such. And I know this is going to sound like a dumb question, seeing that everything we've seen here today and how this has affected the families and helped them find closure, but why do police officers and the police, why do you continue to try to solve these cases years and decades on Well, as evidence uh, in this case, these, uh, this offender continued his uh, uh, criminal behavior. And uh, we have to continue these investigations. We have to continue to pursue these individuals to interrupt them and, and, and prevent them from victimizing anyone else. Is there a sense of, uh, I don't know if it's disappointment when you clear a case, but someone has a suspect who's not living and can't be held accountable in the criminal justice system? Uh, so this is certainly a win for the team. It's uh, the fruits of all their efforts, their labor, their time invested in this um, have paid off. We've identified him. Uh, they uh, completed that uh, task. It is tempered by the fact to some degree that uh, we can't file a case with the district attorney's office and see this through and, and see justice and allow the uh, families of the, of the victims to confront him and, and to provide information to the court. Uh, as well. Um, but it's still a success. It provides uh, a closure, uh, we hope, for the family. It hopefully demonstrates to our community that we don't stop investigating these cases. Um, we don't forget. And, and going back 40 years uh, is, a, is a big win. I've heard such positive things about Detective Carrie Johnson from some of the families. I don't know if she'd be willing to answer this question, but I would love to hear from her and what it meant for her as a woman to help shed light on the suspect who brought four women of their lives. I'll let Carrie address that. Um, <clears throat> thank you for that question. Um, I don't know that even being a woman plays a part in it. Although, yes, all the victims were women. Um, what plays a part is the hearts of these families and the answers that they deserve. And I can't stand up here and take the credit. Um, there's an entire team of detectives that are standing behind you. Um, many of them have been involved in these cases way longer than I have. Um, as people rotate through the cold case unit and into other units, 
um, they have to pass these cases off, and I was just the one that was blessed enough to collect it. Um, there's also an entire team of people from the district attorney's office in our Denver Crime Lab who have put countless hours and heart into this. Um, what it means to us is knowing there's not an offender out there anymore um, committing crimes against women in our communities, but it also means an immense amount to us that families finally can know what happened to their loved ones. Um, I don't know that I would use the word closure for them, but it's answers and it's resolution and it's, um, it's an end to a story that they never wanted to be a part of. Thank you. Was the suspect known to the victims? Uh, we don't believe he was. Uh, not that we were able to identify through the investigations. So again, thank you all very much for being here. Uh, for those who have worked on these cases, thank you again for all of your efforts. And again, for uh, the family members who were able to Come here today, be with us, and share their stories. Thank you very much. Women's Running Stories, where we explore the intersection between running and life. Because every woman who is committed to a running journey has a story to tell, and this is where you'll find those stories. I am host and producer Sheree Louise Turner. I'm a 53-year-old runner, and together with original music by musician and runner Cormac O'Regan, we bring these inspirational stories to life. Please join us to fuel your adventures. Are you tired of seeing your teen or young adult struggle on a path that clearly isn't the right fit? Is your teenager confused about which direction to take after high school? The future of work is changing rapidly, and our kids need to know all of the options available after high school so they're empowered to make the choice that is best for them. In each episode, we explore the latest trends that are shaping the opportunities of today and tomorrow. I'm your host, Betsy Jewell, and this is the High School Hamster Wheel Podcast.